And thank you to, to New America and Arizona State University for this uh, what should be a very interesting panel on social science and, and the future of war, a panel so diverse we even invited a historian uh, to, to join us, so that should be, should be quite fun. Um, I do want to declare that I believe this is a Princeton free panel, uh, and I haven't checked the KUK state score, but I believe they should be going into halftime here, here shortly, so those that care about real uh, academic rivalries, that's a, a particularly important one. Um, we're going to do this a little bit differently than some of the, the other panels here. I'm going to have each of the panelists give just sort of some initial opening salvos, some initial thoughts on, on uh, academic research, uh, social science, and, and the future of war. And I think we'll just go down the, the column here. So Christian Davenport, University of Michigan, if you'd like to start. Wow. Um, so it was a very interesting enterprise to try to think of exactly what it is that um, social science could teach us about the... Um, future of war. But I think um, I'll start with uh, initially the idea of expanding the conception of what it is that we're talking about. Um, much of the focus has been um, on war, but I think I immediately kind of jumped to the more encompassing categorization, political violence, acknowledging the fact that there's just so many kind of like um, segmented or silo different forms of political violence that people are studying in isolation of one another. And war is, um, I think, this um, amazing um, vacuum of sorts that pulls in a lot of different forms, but we need to get to this more disaggregated understanding of it, and also try to think of exactly what's on the end of, other end of that continuum. I'm trying to get to the understanding of kind of positive peace. I'm kind of going back to something that someone talked about earlier, thinking about what is on the opposite end of what it is we're trying to create, what it is that we're trying to kind of build, what is, the, what is it we'd like the war to kind of basically help us um, establish and doing. But I think also we have this issue of kind of expanding domains as well. Um, what we're finding in much of the social science literature is that we've had those people that studied interstate conflicts and now a group studying intrastate, but then it's kind of like now we're in this um, subnational disaggregated push, which is now international, national, subnational, community, familial, um, individual, and then trying to figure out systematically exactly how all these fit together. And I think that's one of the things that different parts of the academic community would be able to put together. Um, I use that phrase very loosely because I don't know to what extent we are a community. So um, one of the difficulties I found in terms of trying to think of what social science had to offer was that, that presumed that we actually coordinated well amongst one another, which I don't think is necessarily the case. But they were, I think, were joining many other groups and simultaneously trying to overcome those difficulties. There was also have an issue of kind of expanding disciplines. Um, it would be interesting. I mean, we have, we have a historian, but political science, sociology, psychology. I think we need to also get to this point of understanding the interdisciplinary nature of the thing that we're studying and try to also work out exactly how those fit together. Um, again, I don't think academia is necessarily the best place to talk about exactly how that works out because <laughs> many places aren't working that out. Everyone has their kind of turf battles or their particular methodology or their particular source that they're pushing or their particular theoretical orientation, but I think we need to overcome that. And, and lastly, I think it's kind of related to this. Uh, we can get this expansion of um, methods and try to think about exactly how distinct forms of collecting information actually could or could not fit together and try to play those out, but also acknowledging that we're not really good enough at doing that. But we do have the different parts of the methods, but not necessarily how they all fit together with one another in a kind of an integrated fashion. So I think of the things that we could get from social science is that we kind of had the parts to piece together where that understanding would come from, but also we're a little bit too fractious and haven't necessarily had that as the objective of something that we could do. Excellent. And with 10 seconds to spare. Thank you. Great. I threatened him with being brutal on the timekeeping so that we could keep things, <laughs> keep things moving. So. Fatini Christia from MIT. Yeah, You're I'm going to kind of continue on uh, from uh, Chris's points. There's definitely has, there has been a surge in social science on warfare in the years that America has been fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we have indeed moved away from these macro level uh, statements about war uh, to more micro levels of analysis, as Chris highlighted, all the way down to kind of the individual. Um, but it's, we've also tried to move away from just theorizing on onset, like why wars start or how they end, to try to also understand the dynamics. So basically now we're interested in why people join um, insurgencies or how do they exact violence, how do warring groups form alliances. And the fact that we've become increasingly interested in these type of uh, questions that are more uh, focused on dynamics has also meant that we've moved away from cross-country data sets where we were able to establish some kind of correlations 
that uh, lower GDP per capita leads to higher likelihood of civil war or that ethnic fractionalization doesn't necessarily correlate well with, the ethnic, with conflict to trying to get at more causal arguments. So basically what we see now is um, uh, people who are uh, pursuing research designs within countries, so they go and study Afghanistan or Iraq, for example, and they try to make causal arguments, for instance, about the effect of uh, um, development aid on counterinsurgency outcomes, or about how uh, whether monetary incentives work in demobilizing combatants, for instance. So uh, we see this kind of shift in research design, but we also see a shift in measurement strategies. So uh, people still get to the ground. They realize that you absolutely need to talk to combatants. You need to talk to civilians. You need to get the perspectives of the insurgent and the counterinsurgent. And they've tried to be clever about it by creating survey instruments that involve experiments and other methods to make sure that people are not just telling you what they think you want to hear. But they've also been very creative about leveraging data without even getting on the ground at all. So for instance, they've looked at, at call data records uh, to get information that is incredibly granular and very networked. They've looked at satellite imagery and uh, some, some recent examples of work like that I found exciting and maybe we can discuss is people who've looked at nightlight coverage in Syria as a measure of over time deterioration of regime control or some work that I'm, I've been working on that looks at the effects of communications after drone strikes using call data records out of Yemen. I wanna close with the, the fact that even though we have uh, kind of tried to improve on the knowledge we're getting out of these places and we've been creative about measurement and research design, I feel that those have come at a cost of generality. So we feel very confident about this very specific questions we're able to answer, but we don't really know if this knowledge we are accumulating travels well. So we don't necessarily know whether the lessons out of Afghanistan apply to Iraq, to Syria, et cetera. And I think this is something we could discuss. Great question. Great questions for us to explore, I think, as we have this panel. Next up, we have Will Moore uh, from Arizona State University. Good afternoon, thank you for turning out. Appreciate being a part of this. Back in uh, the summer of 2014, the New York Times published an op-ed written by a, a political scientist arguing that political scientists can't forecast. Turns out that's a false statement, but a lot of people don't know that. And, uh, and the public discourse on this, and we see it in stock markets, you turn on ESPN, you see this, there's this, 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 there's this false binary out there that, uh, you know, it's like the, the old Miller Lite commercial, tastes great, less filling, right? <laughs> analytics, not analytics, and that's just silly. And what we need to do is stop thinking that way. Analytics are an important part of decision makers' portfolios. That's the message I want to leave you with. It. Now, why am I telling you about this? Well, statistical forecasting systems of conflict events exist and are already used on a daily basis in the United States military. Many of you are probably familiar with IARPA's recent uh, program in emulating a successful DARPA effort. That's the one that's under daily use in uh, the Department of Defense. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's uh, integrated crisis early warning system uh, uh, known by the acronym IQs. And you might be wondering, well, what, what, what does this do if you haven't heard of it? What kind of things can you forecast? Uh, and it's forecasting things such as armed attacks, bombings, protests, rebellions. Um, how do these systems work? Just a quick thumbnail sketch. One does computerized textual analysis of news reports and other documents. They could be posted on websites or tweets or whatever. Of dissident groups uses that information to forecast protest and violence by such groups under a bunch of different kinds of models. To offer an example, there's an IQ's uh, uh, related project that predicted values of monthly, how many monthly armed attacks would groups like Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula produce. Um, several other groups such as the FARC, Nigeria, Delta, Justice and Equality Movement in Sudan, Sudan and all of those are grading out at better than a 0.8 uh, correlation. Um, the point of these brief, com brief comments is that people who believe that political scientists are not producing useful forecasts are ignorant and out of touch. More importantly, decision makers increasingly understand that binary conversations about analytics or quants versus whatever um, are, uh, are, are unhelpful. The question is not whether or not to use statistical forecasting models of conflict events. The question is how to usefully engage them as one part of your intelligence portfolio. Some of you may have noticed the ridiculous bling I've got on my finger. This is my 2013 national championship ring for Florida State football. 
I have it because Jimbo Fisher, the head coach at Florida State, understands this. He had no idea what the heck I was doing. He took me on in 2007 as a volunteer, despite the fact that I had no experience beyond high school football. I wasn't doing anything fancy, just descriptive statistics. But I was taking a completely different approach. I didn't have any theory. It was straight data, data uh, mining. And I was studying opponents' uh, opponents' uh, tendencies. And uh, I can bore you with stories later if you're interested in knowing that specifically what, what role did I play in getting this ring when we beat Auburn. But um, I, I, I want to uh, sh- um, close with a provocative claim. A short provocative claim. <laughs> <laughs> There's not too much of an exaggeration to say that in 2016, security policymakers in Washington can be divided into two groups. Those who are learning how to make use of statistical forecasts as part of their information toolkit, and those who are going to become roadkill. I look forward to your comments. General McMaster. Okay, so as the historian here, first of all, it's a great privilege to be here with all of you. you know, I, th- I think I have to bring up the old, you know, the old joke about okay, that that works in practice, but will it work in theory, <laughs> right? So, I think I think history makes very very important contributions to our understanding the future of war, because if we don't understand how we got to today, it's very difficult to make a grounded projection uh, into, the, into the near future, to understand the demands that will be placed on, on humanity by, by, uh, by armed conflict in, in the future. And so what I'd like to do is, is make a plug for understanding continuities, and General Milley talked about continuities in the nature of war, as well as change. And I think social science has an immensely important role, really, in four key areas. The first is to help us understand not just war, but warriors. You know, in his, in his great book uh, that looked at, at conflict and battle over four centuries, uh, the historian John Keegan said that what battles have in common is human. The struggle of men and, of course, women uh, today trying to reconcile their instinct for self-preservation with the achievement of some aim over which others are trying to kill them. And so it's important for us to understand how we need to prepare soldiers. What are the requirements for warriors in the future? And and I think this is an important topic to study. It's one of our Army war fighting challenges. There's a snappy pamphlet in the back you can pick up. But these are, it's one of our 21st order questions, the answers to which will help us prepare the future Army. And that question is how to develop resilient soldiers, adaptive leaders, and cohesive teams who are capable of fighting and winning in environments of uncertainty and persistent danger. And so I think social science can certainly help us in that connection. The second key area I think they can help us really understand, and, and Christian and Will and Fotini already talked about this, understand the problem set within conflict and, and to understand our enemies better, to frame the problem sets, to understand not just the enemy, but the people among whom these conflicts are fought, and, and, and Christian already mentioned that already. Uh, so, and I know that you're going to talk about hybrid war and so forth later. It's becoming even more important, I think, to understand really the nature of your enemy, but then how you interact with that enemy in context not just of geography, but in context of the populations and the cultural and political and social and economic and religious factors that affect your mission and, and the outcome. The third thing I think social science can help us do is engage people. Because ultimately, conflict is, is aimed at altering human behavior. And human behavior is what is, is fundamentally at the, at the, at the basis of, of violence. I mean, I, what, what does ISIS do? I mean, they pit communities against each other. They portray themselves as a patron and protector of one of those parties. And then use control of populations to, to, to accelerate that cycle of violence. So we have to be able to separate the enemy from sources of strength. And, and that's physically, but also psychologically and, and politically. And then the, the fourth thing is that, that social science can help us understand the problem of future war. Talking about really threats, enemies, and adversaries, understanding patterns and projecting forward. But, but as Zachary Shore has said, you know, in a great book uh, about a set called A Sense of the Other, it's really the pattern break that's really important. We talked a lot about Russia. Pattern break was uh, like in 2008, I think. Also understanding our missions technology and its influence on war, but the interaction of technology and people, and then, of course, history and lessons learned. And then the question is, will anybody listen to social scientists about it? Uh, And I'm I'm sometimes skeptical about it because I think we try to turn future war into something that's alien to the nature of war. We we tend to define future wars we would like it to be, right? Really, you know, fast, cheap, 
efficient, waged from offshore standoff distances. And, uh, and so we, we have right, to really Edgar. guard against self-delusion. Excellent. Um, we're going to come to a couple of questions, for, and I've asked the panel to think about what their research and their time in the field suggests about the future of war. But I want to ask a little bit more kind of uh, geeky type question, um, which is uh, both uh, Will's talked about kind of statistical forecasting, uh, and I've done a lot of work on the, the text applications you know, of that, uh, the earlier work on, on IQs and whatnot. Fatini's talked about some of the work on uh, call data in, in Yemen, and I know Chris has done uh, some really incredible kind of archival and field collection work of, of data. And if we can kind of come up just a little bit um, in a world of big data applications, the Defense Department, other parts of the US government are, are very keen to sort of realize the power of all of this data, which we're told we're just a mass, you know, a wash in all the time. How does, what can social science tell us about how to judge that data, how to find the signal in all of that noise, and then how to make this last part, as General McMaster said, uh, you know, that translation, right? So not just you know, being clever in the data discovery strategies, um, but also using that to really inform decision making. Bettini, can I ask you to start? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think the really important thing when you're dealing with kind of massive troves of data is to actually have a very solid knowledge of the context. Um, so to also to kind of guide yourself as to where you would expect to find the signal in the noise and also go in it with clear hypotheses of what you expect to find. So I appreciated the point of, you know, there's incredible power in mining data, which is true. But if you have kind of 700 million calls and over 17 million callers, for instance, in one of the data sets that I'm working with, it's very hard to go just completely blind and looking for hotspots. So uh, just to use an example, um, out of Yemen, we, we, we have these three years worth of call records the year before the Arab Spring, the year during, and the year after. And we were very keen to try and use a coded data set of the protests and overlay call records over protest events to try and kind of get the anatomy of a revolution, try to understand how people mobilize in the context of collective action for protests. Um, and we realized that had we not known the exact geographic locations of where to look, the times of events, the qualitative uh, information of how uh, demonstrations, which were violent, which were not, it would have been really difficult to try and identify patterns. Um, I'm gonna leave it at this, but I also wanted to raise the ethical aspects mm -hmm. of dealing with this type of data. And what's interesting is that even though social science has developed an array of rules for th that you have to go through human subjects committees for, for different types of experimental work or otherwise, uh, we're really behind in terms of uh, how to work with, the, with big data. So it's, uh, I've experienced, I mean, trying to think of how to even present this type of research. I've struggled with making sure that the data cannot be de-anonymized, even though it's anonymous, and figuring out what's the exact le level of analysis to, to present it in. Well, quick thoughts, then we'll go to Christian. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, they, there's one, one way to try to answer that as well. There's machine learning and there's theory. Um, as is the two ways that you try to try, try to split that out, and I think one of the one of the problems that um, that Washington has had is that the that that a, a technical you know it, a lot of the funding has gone to engineering firms, and engineering firms are very good at selling a, a, a system and uh, bringing no theory whatsoever to it, and that goes back to something that, that you know that uh, that was uh, said a minute ago, which is in and, and this is our fault. Social scientists are very bad at interacting with policymakers, and, and, and that's something that we need to improve. And we can sit there and blame the policymakers, but the reality is we're terrible at it. And, um, and with their, there's also a training gap, but it's about to start getting bridged. Um, social science is moving toward teamwork. We're going to see my generation, no, but the people who are being trained today are going to have to develop careers working in teams and working with teams in, with uh, people with computer science degrees and all sorts of other things. And the computer scientist should never have to be responsible for the theory, even if the theory is nothing more than identifying what's the set of variables I include in my machine learning algorithm. So, um, we're not, we're not there yet. We've got to learn a whole bunch of new things. We've got to learn how to work in teams. We've got to learn how to work with computer scientists. And we've got to learn how to communicate effectively, developing, learning the languages that you all use and learning how to interface with you rather than trying to sit there and give my, here's my five-minute speech on my research and expect that you guys are going to be interested in following that. 
Chris, do you have thoughts on evaluating data? Funny. Um, so one, I'm not, I'm not a big data fan. I'm a better data fan, and that there's, a, there's a big distinction between them. I think part of the problem is a lot of the stuff that we're receiving is kind of the noise. We get to a better understanding of exactly what's kind of being tapped when we're engaging in kind of triangulation. But if all the money is being tossed in one particular direction towards a particular type of data collection, then we'll think that we basically have, wow, we have like 5,000 respondents or 5 million or 800,000 or something, thinking that we're actually able to tap some phenomena. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, so I'm methodologically eclectic to not trust any of them well enough to basically kind of rely upon any one. And thus, I think we need to kind of push in this kind of like multifaceted direction. The other thing about kind of like not talking to one another or not respecting or not hearing one another is clearly the two-way street, right? So I was at the University of Maryland for a long time, and so I don't believe that politicians, scholars, NGOs, or the military are necessarily good at speaking to one another in part because it's an iterated conversation, right? So you need to get through, oh, that's what you mean by inference. Oh, that's what you mean by data. And that takes time to kind of work through those. And if the, you have this constant rotation of individuals, then having to reestablish exactly how you speak to one another in the first place, then that's going to be problematic. So the sustained interaction, I think, is necessary for doing that. But I think we all do it poorly. That certainly speaks to one of the uh, great benefits that academic networks can, can provide, uh, and I think some that General McMaster has, has leveraged, which is you know, the way that these, um, whether it's collaboration amongst particular research partners or a lot of this is driven by interpersonal connections, right, and personality, whether that's, you know, for, for good, for good or ill. HR, can you speak just for a minute sort of how you've leveraged academic work in, you know, whether in your work in Af Iraq or Afghanistan or currently at ARCIC? Well, it's, I mean, I, I think it's essential to have the connection to academia uh, because these are complex problems. And if we don't frame the problem properly, if we don't understand the problem, uh, we'll, we'll engage in, in military activity uh, and confuse that activity for progress toward achieving our objectives. And so I think a, a lot of this, a lot of our connection to academia can help us really understand the nature of the problem, ask some first order questions, you know, about, about what is driving the conflict, you know, and, and to recognize, you know, the, the limits of our own understanding uh, by, by interacting with those who are, have real regional expertise, who have expertise in, in uh, political science and social science, who can also help us understand the complex causality uh, of these problems, mm -hmm. and then also the, the, uh, the opportunities that exist for us to, to affect these problem sets, but also uh, the limitations. Before we get to the sort of my final question about uh, for, for you all, and then we'll, we'll move to, to the audience, um, I do want to ask uh, the, the panel for sort of their thoughts on, on how social science research has, has changed uh, over the last 15 years, basically, through this period of, of the war on terror. Uh, I started graduate school the day after 9-11. Uh, I lived three miles from, from Logan Airport. Fatini and I were, were, were classmates. I don't remember when exactly you got to Boston, Fatini. Um, but it was still, uh, you know, terrorism as a, as, a, as a field of study was not a career advancing move for the most part. Uh, studying protest movements or contentious politics, which is really Christian and, and Will's uh, background, was, was still not the, certainly the emphasis in a lot of, a lot of programs. Uh, I remember even being told in, in 2006 when I was studying counterinsurgency campaigns, my department chair said, insurgencies, really? Does anyone care about that? Um, you know, not uh, Harvard University's greatest, greatest day. Um, a lot has changed in the 10 years since that conversation took, took place, uh, my defection from academia not, notwithstanding. Um, what else has changed in the way we do social science research, both in the methods but also in uh, the topics uh, that we see uh, social science starting to, to focus on. I should note, we're all political scientists with the exception of, of HR up here. So when we talk about social science, we're really not getting into these, you know, sociology or, or the cognitive sciences um, that have a lot to offer here and I think probably might take us to the next step. But from the political science side, what's, what's changed? Chris? Given the setup, I, I'm trying not to be... Um Oh, really pessimistic, right? But um, so I think um, I think some things have changed. So it's now. Um, I remember. Um, so I, I came out in '92 from grad school, and I remember there was like two jobs that talked about conflict and violence, and you're kind of going, okay. Uh, I had, I had at least two jobs, which two years before that there weren't. That wasn't even that wasn't even there. Um, and so now it's quite frequent. We're not at the stage yet where every department suggests that they need to have somebody that studies conflict and violence, and they know something about it. And then, unfortunately, it's trendy, right? So then a lot of people think we need a civil war person, or we need someone that does terrorism. 
and every now and then maybe someone that does human rights violations. And so I think we now have more understanding that you'll see a few of those people. But there's very few programs. Like if you're looking for a program, like an undergraduate or someone will come to you and be like, where can I go study conflict and violence? Which program should I go to? There's very few places that are like, they have the people, there's like a working kind of group, there's some data that they're collecting and they're just punching out publications and training people. There's very few places that are doing that explicitly. There's, there's, you could have parts of that. You have some people, you have some workshops, you have some people doing some data, so you, most of us are doing publishing. But very few of those kind of piece together. But we now have the parts that exist to actually start piecing that together. But you start looking across programs, especially in like the more elite institutions, you'll be hard pressed to find more than one or two individuals that study anything that we're talking about in this room. So it's coming down the pike, I think. So that, that perspective, I think we should be very optimistic about. There's now more people that are studying it. Now, what they're studying, how they're studying it, I'll definitely quibble with some of that because I think it, some people are trying to be a little bit too um, trendy and think about exactly what is hot now as opposed to thinking more systematically about what is it that we actually need to know. So there's kind of like an organizational turn, right? A lot of people want to study organizations, security force institutions of different forms. But somehow we got started on this militia thing, and so people are off studying militias. And I'm like, talk about the sideshow versus the main event. And so it's <laughs> kind of like, it's very interesting how these things kind of emerge. But I'm generally optimistic in the fact that I think that there's now a conversation, there's now people, there's now some training. But I'm clearly, I clearly would have thought more would have happened in terms of um, support for the training in the institutional buildings and so forth. I think in many respects, Europe is way ahead of us in terms of the training of the individuals and institutes and so forth. And so I think uh, we kind of need to catch up. Interesting. Shift gears now and to have each of you just say briefly kind of what your research or your observations on the future of war are likely to, to look like. Are there trends that you see from, from your own research? Um, are there trends that you've observed uh, you know, through your field work uh, or through your work with other students or other institutions um, that give you some insight into kind of our, our broader project here today and what the, and the, the future, future of war? Will, can we start with you? Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm actually going to go back to a, a topic that was raised a little bit earlier um, in, in an earlier panel, and, uh, and, and an observation that wasn't raised there is that uh, I like to think about w what, what it's like when you're in a democratic country rather than an autocratic country, and, and we have, especially in this country, a real tendency to think, oh, that's good things. There's always good things in democracies. And, um, and, and the question was about uh, perpetual war, and nobody wanted to bring up that we've done this before multiple times. We've had um, we, we've had a cold war. Nobody nobody wanted to think about um, the role that fear plays and the the quite rational incentives that politicians have to play to fear because it mobilizes and gets people to the polls. Okay, uh, George Bush, when he's sitting there after 9-11, had a choice to make. How the heck was that guy going to get reelected president? I mean, well, you know, think about that. What, you know, the, he was what dead is your, water, what right? your research saying, Will? What is right. your sort of, on the academic side, are we seeing in terms of the future of war? Um, I'm going to leave it there. Okay. Fatini. Yeah, I mean, uh, in my case, I feel like some of the challenges we're confronted with is trying to study things for which we just don't have empirical evidence. For example, cyber warfare. We, there's no empirics, so how do you even begin to study it? I know colleagues are trying to look at the legal frameworks or just come up with general theories, but if it's something is covert, how do you even go about studying it? Um, things have, I, I think we've become a lot more creative with uh, drone strikes, for example, that are also covert, but being at New America, I mean, I think they were at the forefront coding the events, and uh, we're actually using their data set now to try to look at the effects that r drone strikes have on communications using the cell phone metadata. So people can try to be creative at, at, at getting at these things, but I think one of the main uh, struggles we're going to face is how do you study things for which you cannot do uh, empirically-based research. Uh, the other issue, I think, is combining technology with uh, real shoe leather. So I appreciated mm -hmm. Chris's comment about how you really need to be multi-method multi in, in what you do. And I'm, I'm thinking about some recent research of colleagues who looked at uh, satellite imagery out of Iraq, and they were basically looking at areas that were 
controlled by the Islamic State and then taken over by the Iraqi army. And they were looking at buildings and then looking at what buildings were, how many buildings were being destroyed as a measure of a, a kind of retaliation of the Iraqi army reprisals against locals who were allegedly supporting the Islamic State. And then when you talk to Iraqi army people or people of uh, kind of the uh, Hashd al-Shabi militias, they basically tell you that they had to destroy these uh, buildings because they were booby trapped. So in their render, like their version of the story, they're protecting the population. While you know what the researchers were interpreting just based on the satellite imagery is that it was you know uh, because these, it was just in retaliation. And I'm not saying one or the other has the you know the real ground truth, but all I'm trying to say is that you can't just do it with big data alone. You actually have to also have the ground story. Christian. Um, so. Um, there's an interesting finding, I think it's been around for a couple of decades, but um, if you think about it, it's kind of intriguing. So behavioral challenges from people that are going against governments tends to always lead to some government coercive or, or forceful response. Um, but when you flip it and you're looking at government coercive violent activity, it has seemingly every effect on behavioral challenges. Um, sometimes it increases dissent, sometimes it decreases it, sometimes it has a delayed effect. Um, What's intriguing is this has now been established relatively um, well, but we don't really understand what the imbalance means. So like if the government course of activity and you don't know exactly what the response to that government course of activity is going to be, why would you engage in the government course of activity? So we've paid very little attention to that particular question um, historically. Uh, now there's some, some work on it. We're kind of like, well, okay, well actually we're, we're, we're aggregating too much government activity. Um, what we really need to do is kind of look at the selective or indiscriminate nature of it or look at the violent or nonviolent nature of it. Or maybe we're just lumping things together, right? So if you're looking at national level characteristics or national level trends or subnational or neighborhood level, you're getting differences there. But we haven't really played enough with these kind of different levels of analysis, but that's kind of where we're going. Um, related to that, it's kind of this, I mentioned before, this organizational churn, right? We're just kind of like, maybe it matters who is engaging in the course of activity, which particular institution, which particular unit, which particular group of individuals, and, and that's relatively new that we're getting there. Um, if you're looking at the kind of like um, government course of activity directed towards challengers, um, my last book kind of showed that we've been looking at repression as kind of a cost and somewhat um, within these contexts, within some behavioral challenging context, it's a benefit. It's like you are, you're now marked by this particular course of activity. Look, look, look who I am and then your resiliency and your ability to try to overcome that is actually one of the things that is kind of propelling you to continue. And I think this kind of shows the kind of organizational and individual intersection that we kind of like need to push down on. Um, the last point would be this issue of trying to figure out whether or not those particular findings are varying by the sources that we're consulting. So um, do media sources have a particular interest in trying to convey a particular increase or decrease for what the behavioral challenges are doing? They have a vested interest in telling a particular story. Or when you're doing interviews with challengers, do they have a vested interest in telling you that they fought back um, diligently beside the fact that behaviorally you couldn't really document that in any other way? Um, but looking across the sources, I think, is also something that's uh, emerging from this particular paradox. HR, we're going to come back to you. I want to take just a couple questions from the audience here, here quickly. And I'm going, to ins I'm going to use what I learned last year as the Jake Tapper rules. And we're going to go girl, boy, girl, boy in answer asking these questions. So we'll start off, start off that way. Ma'am, here in the front. We're trying to keep the conference here on time. So if we can keep those questions punchy and to the point, that'd be appreciated. Maria Smith, I'm with the Department of State. Um, for our one non-political scientist, or if you guys have any opinions on this, when I was doing my master's degree, actually, at University of Michigan, um, I was going through a Russian studies program, and I was one of the few sort of national security-focused people doing that program. And what I really observed was that in terms of the historians, military history or anything along those lines was regarded as pretty archaic. It wasn't interesting to them. In terms of the anthropologists, it was not just uninteresting to them to look at security challenges, but they actually reported colleagues being essentially blacklisted for wanting to work with the US military or do anything along those lines. Um, do you think that still holds true? Is there just too big an ideological and interest divide in those fields for them, for these people to contribute to the work we do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think that there shouldn't be, you know, a divide about this. You know, I kind of tempted to, to paraphrase Raymond Bradbury, you know, when he was asked about Fahrenheit 451, they said, you know, 
are you trying to predict the future in this book? And he said, hell no, I'm trying to prevent it. So I think what we need to do is to study war, to study future war as a way to prevent it, right? And it's our understanding of war and our understanding of warriors that makes wars, if they do occur, less inhumane, right? And so I think if we have a flawed conception about future war, for example, that reduces war to a big targeting exercise, and we don't understand the human, the cultural, the political drivers of conflict, the same drivers that Thucydides identified, right? Fear, honor, and interest. We're only gonna treat the symptoms. We're gonna prolong the war, and this is, this is not in keeping with just war theory, right? So to go into a war without having a way to get to that just end is unethical as well as you know, stupid to do that. So, so we, have to think, we have to think clearly about the problem of war and, and warfare, and we need the academy to help us do that. Christian, you wanted to respond. Um, immediately when you, when you were asking your question, I, I was hearing it in a different way, and, and the way that I was hearing it was, um, do I lose out of my ability to speak to rebels and those that kind of challenge political authorities if I go for a Minerva grant? Hell yeah. I mean, but it is also, I mean, so um, I did research Minerva in- Minerva Grant being a DOD program funding social science research sorry. in universities, yeah. yes. I mean, I did some stuff on, um, on uh, Rwanda and Northern Ireland, and I was clearly benefited by being an African American because of their perceptions of what that meant. I was getting, I was getting to meet all types of challenging individuals because of the presumption of exactly, oh, you, well, clearly, if anyone's against the United States, you must have some gripes, so <laughs> we'll, we'll run with you. And so- did I, did, I, did I use that? Yes. Um, but then if anyone was looking at kind of like who had funded my research, they might have had some problems. And I'm asked a couple of interesting questions at some point about that. So we've been thinking of collaboration as all benefit. There's this cost part, too, with regards to how that's going to hinder your ability to reach certain types of audiences, which is going to be a major issue. I'm not sitting this far away from Mr. McCaster because I've just realized that actually, but I'm just like, <laughs> but clearly there's the, these kind of issues where these dyadic kind of partnerships are going to have these unintended consequences that we haven't necessarily thought through. But I know that people are in, in the academy thinking about this. This does come up quite frequently where you're getting your money from and out in the field. You, you don't want to have that conversation with exactly where did you get your money from, but it's clearly a problem. I think it's good for there to be a healthy tension between the communities. You don't want all these groups seeing these questions from the same perspective. You can't then challenge those perspectives. But the question is how to avoid that hostility, right, uh, and the sort of stereotyping that occurs in lots of different directions, um, you know, amongst these. Shot. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that too. Um, gentleman in the back. Chick, Fel Chick Feldner, NAMO. What I'm curious about. How is the communication between an operational commander who thinks he needs some analysis and are you able or would you want to help redefine his problem or figure out a research project to get to what he or she is looking for? I've relied very, very heavily on, on academics from multiple disciplines uh, to help in Afghanistan and Iraq, for example. When we went into northern Iraq in, in uh, 2000 and, and, um, 2005, and sadly, it looked kind of like it looks right now, Al-Qaeda had largely taken over, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had largely taken over the northern part of the country. I called West Point, and I asked my friend in the history department if he knew anybody who could help. And he sent a major Dan Bernard, uh, who had done his, his uh, dissertation at the University of Chicago, on the 1919-1920 on the, uh, revolt against the British in Nineveh province. I've relied on Colonel, Colonel Joel Rayburn, who's here today as well, for that kind of deep cultural understanding, really, to be able to go in asking the right questions and understand the, the, uh, the political, tribal, uh, ethnic, religious dynamics within a particular area. And then also just to understand complex problem sets. Uh, you know, I had the privilege of, of commanding a task force in Afghanistan. It was a counter-corruption and organized crime task force called Shafafiat. And so I brought in many area experts, but also, uh, but also uh, social scientists, uh, law enforcement experts to understand really the political foundations of that problem and, and, uh, and then to work with Afghans on, on, a, on a way ahead. So uh, the, uh, the academy has been very accessible to me. And I think uh, what's important is to, is to just have those lines of communication open so that when you do come up against complex problems, you can bring the right people together. And again, it's important to get people to listen, right? I mean, we talked about Iraq and, you know, the, the, not the, there was war planning that happened, but a plan wasn't developed that was informed 
by some of the experts like David Pierce, who's now our ambassador to Greece, who did the Iraq study. So the key is that you know, we on the operational side, uh, whether it's diplomats or soldiers, have to listen. Uh, and as, as I think that's a bigger obstacle than access to the academy. Christian, and then we'll wrap up. Actually, kind of related to your question, I was kind of thinking about and um, immediately kind of referenced the, the network dynamics. I mean, he, he, made, a con he made a call to, to, to West Point, but I'm, I'm just kind of thinking of how we're tapping, like who's, who's academia, right? Who's social science, getting back to a point I was making before. Because I, I think part of what's difficult about kind of accessing the academy is um, much, of the, much of the modeling we have is archaic. So we're waiting for someone that has that clearly established book that's been published, which is probably two years late, right? From inception to writing and distribution, what we really want is like the state of the art work being done. Which, in all likelihood, good luck finding it because it's like SSRN or it's peace science or it's happening in someone's classroom at that moment. And we haven't figured out a way to actually get to the state of the art technologies and people that are working on stuff that could directly speak to the issues that are need that are needed in many respects and being able to access that in some kind of easily kind of rectifiable manner where someone's prompting what kind of questions they'd like and that is going on out on some secured site where everybody could like cling into it and kind of identify, well, I could do that probably easily or I'd love to actually get engaged in type of that, type, that type of thing. But our, the model that we have set up to do it now, waiting for the article, waiting for the book, having some reputation or looking to the same institutions to kind of provide that kind of knowledge when they're not doing the best work, that's the thing that I think we kind of need to break down and figure out exactly how to get our heads around and kind of tap the network that actually exists. And I think New America and ASU are trying to be one force of, of, of bridging that gap. There are other literally bridging the gap uh, efforts between policy communities and, and, and academia. Um, but I think that this is you know, certainly part, part of, the, of the challenge. Um, HR, we didn't get to you earlier on the thoughts on, on the future of war. You can see the clock ticking down in front of us there. Uh, you know, I'll let you have the, the concluding thoughts here. Well, I think the key thing is to make a grounded projection into the future. And one way to do that is to understand our most recent conflicts as a starting point. You know, the, the, the old saying, hey, the military is you know, usually ready to fight the last war. That's actually incorrect. I mean, the militaries that have problems are those that study the past and their recent and ongoing experiences only superficially. So I think what we've learned is quite a bit. We've learned that war is not a big targeting exercise, that war is essentially political, and that the consolidation of military gains politically is an integral part of war. It has to be an integral part of campaign planning. And so I think as we look to the future, we have to develop capabilities across our joint force, but across our government, that allows us to achieve outcomes consistent with the vital interests that brought us into conflict to begin with. And so I think that when we look toward the future, we have to look at geopolitical trends, which are not going in a good direction. I think that the work that uh, Jakob Griegel and Wes Mitchell have done on this in a, a new book called The Unquiet Frontier is very good. And, and this looks at really, geopolitics is back, right? The end, I think the invasion of Ukraine punctuated the end of the post-Cold War period. We're in a different period now, where we have weak states that, are, that, that, that surround revisionist powers. So I think, that, I think that the chance of great power conflict is higher now than it's been in the last 70 years. And we also have, I think, a grave threat from non-state actors. What all these conflicts have in common, though, is they're about the control of territory, people, and resources. So what we need to cope with that is a balanced joint force capability. I think the trend in war that has given us our advantages from standoff range, it's bottomed out because, because of, of a new, new technological countermeasures and so forth. We ought to pay attention to what's going on in the South China Sea. We ought to pay attention to the fact that Russia has established air supremacy over Ukraine from the ground. So I think the character of warfare is changing but I think we, as we look at the, at the geopolitical dynamics and the threats, uh, I think that the, the, the danger is high and, and, uh, and rising of conflict, which means you know, we've got to be ready because, the, as George Washington said, the most effectual way of preventing war is to be prepared for it. So. Well, I think that's an excellent segue into our, our next panel. If you would thank the panelists here for me today.